Good evening and welcome to the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education regular meeting. Uh, tonight's meeting will be live streamed on uh, the Oshkosh Media YouTube channel at www.youtube.com backslash c backslash Oshkosh Media. So, is this meeting in compliance with open meeting law notification? Yes, it is. All right, thank you. Please call the roll. Wyman. Here. Carlin. Here. Herzog. Here. Carnes. Here. Peschel. Here. Wright. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, Dr. Davis, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next we are on to the approval of the agenda. Uh, this is typically the, the, the time of the agenda where if we wish to move any items around uh, that a member of the board can make that request to doing that. Is there any items that the board member wishes to move? All right, seeing none, uh, we will move on to board, administrative re board and administrative reports. First up is, uh, is my report uh, as the board president. Um, retirement recognition, and so this is the time of the meeting where we always uh, recognize uh, staff members of the Oshkosh Area School District who have decided to make that jump to retirement and, and, uh, and to create a, a new blazing path in their life. So, um, so first up we have uh, Rebecca Broderson. Uh, she uh, was an EBT te EBD teacher assistant at South Park Middle School. She's been with the district since 2008. So thank you for your time and service. Uh, Thomas Hansen is uh, a recreation department supervisor from Alberta Kimball Auditorium uh, with the recreation department um, and has been with us since 1984. So thank you for your time and energy. Uh, Patricia McGuire is an assistant coach or assistant cook at Oshkosh West High School since 2007. So thank you for your time and your experience and expertise. Um, I, I do like to provide opportunities for board members if they know any of these uh, members uh, through their experiences of being engaged in the school district. And, and I, I want to kind of point out one person that, that's retiring and that's Thomas Hansen who if anyone's been involved in any part of the Alberta Kimball Auditorium and other elements uh, within our community, Tom has been a, a great asset um, uh, within um, supporting uh, the activities that take place at Alberta Kimball in our, not just for our students, but for our community. Um, you can't really have an event, you couldn't have an event at Alberta Kimball without Tom Hansen being there. Um, and so, um, so that means that Tom himself have, has been engaged in probably thousands of activities since 1984 uh, that have supported the lives of students in our district. So, um, so that is, that is a, you know, just a great accolade uh, knowing that. And I, as a student, remember seeing Tom behind the scenes up in the booth or be backstage uh, guiding students uh, in his way that he would guide students uh, and, um, and have great memories of, of his service and time with the district. So, so Tom, thank you for your time. Um, anyone else? Go ahead, Dr. Zuck. Thank you. Uh, I have not known Tom for all of his years in the district, uh, but I think it's, it's pretty special when somebody spends 38 years in a school district. And uh, some people may not know Tom by sight, but they know him by the lighting and the sound that he's been responsible mm -hmm. for, not only for all the numerous student performances from our district, but also things like the Oshkosh Coraliers, which is a, an, an adult um, choral group, um, the Miss Wisconsin Pageant, Miss Oshkosh Pageant, um, Oshkosh Symphony Orchestra in its day, Oshkosh Youth Symphony. So he truly has impacted the lives of thousands and thousands of students and staff and community members in a positive way. He will be missed. And uh, that record of 38 years in the Alberta Kimball Auditorium is, is, uh, is really special. So we, I just want to wish all the best to all of our retirees. We, 
we will miss you and we really appreciate the positive impact you've had on our students, families, and community. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Wonderful. So thank you for your time and service to the Oshkosh Area School District. Um, next up is a uh, Wisconsin school news article. So uh, many of us um, received this in the mail this week as uh, school board members did, uh, actually it was last week, uh, every school board member in the state of Wisconsin most likely was provided this uh, magazine that's put out by the Wisconsin Association of School Boards. Um, we were highlighted in this, in this, uh, in this, um, this one, <laughs> in this month's uh, magazine, and um, specifically, Dr. Herzog and I uh, were interviewed about our use of this of the of the joint tool of WASB and the school perception survey that we um, have been using to um, work on our board development goals and areas. Um, and so, uh, so it was it was felt really good to be this to be the president representing uh, the Board of Education um, and knowing that they were um, highlighting our use of, of how we're using utilizing this tool. So, um, so that's all I have to say about that. Dr. Herzog, is there anything you would like to add to that? I think it was pretty special to be singled out um, for that. I, I believe in continuous improvement that's built into our uh, numerous policies and this was a good way to highlight continuous improvement and share what's going on in a positive way in the Oshkosh School District with districts across the state. So mm -hmm. and it's, we'll, it was great. We'll, thank you for that. And, um, and we'll get into that in my last topic as well, or just a little bit more because this article feeds into some of our next steps of our, of our, of our continuous improvement. So, um, so next up is or was the National Night Out. Um, last Tuesday, August 2nd, there were 14 neighborhood parties uh, that were under the auspice of the uh, National Night Out, which is a collaboration typically with cities or municipalities, neighborhood associations, and typical departments of, of, the, of the, the city of, the, you know, of those municipalities. In Oshkosh, um, uh, it's mainly with um, Oshkosh Healthy Neighborhoods as an organization that helps build neighborhood revitalization and neighborhood organizations within Oshkosh, as well as um, the city of Oshkosh through the Oshkosh Police Department and the Oshkosh Fire Department and those neighborhood associations. And so um, a couple months back, you know, I've been talking about, I was talking about community engagement. These are one of these areas where I think the board has some really great opportunities to engage with uh, families engage with uh, taxpayers who are part of the Oshkosh Area School District. Um, and so I wanted to provide an opportunity to kind of talk about where I engaged in this process and where any other board member or administration member uh, may, have, may have engaged on August 2nd. So um, I, I had some other, I had some, August 2nd was a very busy evening. So. There was lots of things going on in, in Oshkosh, and so I was only able to make it to two of the um, two of the neighborhood parties. I made it to the the Boys and Girls Club of Oshkosh, and I made it to the River East Neighborhood Association, which took took place in conjunction with uh, Family Night at the Leach Amphitheater, uh, and their uh, their party took place in the Riverside uh, Park right next door. So. Um, all both events were uh, well attended uh, for their neighborhoods, um, and um, there was a lot of youth and families at the Boys and Girls Club, and lots of uh, activities that that provided a great deal of engagement, um, and not just um, you know the games uh, where they can get prizes and they you know they can do that, but there was also um, you know opportunities for families to pick up things that they needed maybe for their household. Um, I think it was. Was it Mid-Morning Kiwanis that was there? Yes. Yeah. Mid-Morning Kiwanis was there uh, promoting their, their book distribution program that they, that they put out to, to families in, in the community. Um, and, so, um, and then also the uh, Breakwater, um, a program of the uh, Winnebago County Health Department in creating resources for those with AODA issues or mental health issues, um, providing resources 
to those uh, individuals, families and individuals as well. So um, Riverside Park was uh, primarily engaged by some families, but also uh, there was you know, an, an older group of, of citizens that are very engaged in creating a, a better neighborhood and um, you know, that they've been working on. And so um, uh, I'm familiar with that neighborhood. I worked really well with that neighborhood and, and they did a great job of creating a meal um, and um, just engaging and having lots of spaces where people could come together and just hang out and talk with each other. So, um, so I, I do want to provide, like I said, I want to provide anyone else the opportunity to kind of give an update on, on whether, you know, if they were able to engage in that. So if anyone wants to go ahead and, and give a small report, they can. I participated sure. in four of these. I, my my uh, immediate neighborhood is not part of a neighborhood association, so I wanted to see what the possibilities might be. So like Bob, I, I spent some time at the Boys and Girls Club. I went over to the Leech, um, where we actually had our bre Brewing Futures truck. Oh, yeah. uh, they yeah. were a very popular stopping point for, for families and, and others. Then I went to Menominee North, which was on the corner of Hazel and Menominee at the Washington statue, George Washington statue, and Menominee South, which was inside Menominee Park at one of the shelters. It was just so much fun to see the relationships that were being built and developed and kids happy and all ages happy and yeah. enjoying music, food, and just one another's company. So it was great. It was also great to see the participation of the Oshkosh Police Department and Oshkosh Fire Department. So a great night. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I just had an opportunity to go to the Boys and Girls Club, so that's been reported out a couple times. But it was, it was great, great to see the mid-morning Kiwanis um, there, and, uh, and and again, just great to see people together. I, I think it's just still part of the yeah. post-pandemic environment of, of uh, you know just some great some great energy. So uh, yeah, so I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts uh, because I know those community or those neighborhood. Uh, events don't take care of themselves, so they need uh, some deliberate planning. So thank you to everybody who uh, contributed to that, and I think that, that makes for a, a healthier community, so appreciate it. Sure. Anyone else? Yeah, I went to the Boys and Girls Club and then to um, Miller's Bay, and I thought both were, it was really neat to be at both. Um, just getting to make connections with people, you know, at a, in an in-person level is, refreshing it's it's a lot nicer than reading comments on Facebook or you know or whatever or getting letters or you know trying to talking about things in that manner I, I really liked like being in person with people so that was really cool and and I would say that the, the neighborhood associations really enjoy that level of engagement as well um, you know just uh, because they any time an elected leader shows up at a community event, it's it, it, there's a different feeling about about that level of engagement. There's interest in in person who has a person who has the ability to help change things. From this type of role, showing up at a community event just goes a long ways, and and I hear that a lot, um, you know, in regards to the things that that a lot of those organizations and entities provide. So, anything else? No. Okay. So the next up is the Sheldon Nature uh, Nature Area Tour. Uh, the board and the community was invited to do a, a kind of a guided tour out at the Sheldon Nature Center on July 14th and July 15th. Um, July 15th uh, it looked a little sketchy in regards to weather, but it uh, it all worked out. So uh, that's the day that I went um, and. Um, I know that there were a couple other board members that one other board member that went on that day and I know that um, some board members uh, went on the 14th as well so um, the tour was extremely engaging um, we were led not by district administrators or by district staff but by the volunteers that kind of do the day in and day outs of maintaining the shelter nature area and so these are uh, neighbors that live uh, adjacent to it or um, they are people that have you know maybe lived there before but still come back and um, volunteer their time and so um, and so what what you really had was uh, three different groups at least on the day that I went 
that took all different directional tours around and were engaged in showing where the changes had taken place from this. And so historically, this was a piece of property that was donated to the district in 1991. Um, that was essentially just um, farmland, forest, um, and a pond. Um, and um, over many years, that um, citizen and school district committee transformed that into what it is today. And so um, just to kind of give you an idea what that committee has done, um, and they provided us some, some information about it. Um, the committee uh, has, been, has, has worked towards a goal of creating an exemplary outdoor education center that's used by the Oshkosh, the entire Oshkosh Area School District, um, but specifically by Oakwood Elementary, which is right next to it. Um, there are at least eight native ecosystems that exist or are under development, including a prairie, a wetland, and a wet mesic forest, <coughs> old field, evergreen forest, and oak savanna, an oak savanna pond and a stream. Um, and so this is a, uh, essentially, they, they, they market it as a living laboratory for students to learn directly from the natural environment uh, and the surrounding community uh, as a natural area and green space. And so, um, so the, the Sheldon, the, the tours are, are timely because they wanted to raise awareness because of a discussion that had been taking place um, in the community in, in the previous months in regards to the, de the degradation of, uh, or I should say the removal, the tree removal of, of ash trees. Um, and so uh, there is a great amount of ash trees that have been targeted by the emerald ash borer and so they're, they're having to create a process to removing these trees. And so uh, their efforts were to educate us on the impacts of the biodiversity of that site, but also to raise awareness that of their plans of the systematic removal of the ash trees throughout the, throughout the site, and then the ability to create um, and to bring in, um, where is it, a, a broader mix of more suitable trees that are resilient uh, to that uh, emerald ash borer. So, um, I thought it was a great tour. I'm very thankful that uh, the committee put it on and uh, that uh, our staff members and our board members that were there to be able to make it and be engaged in that. So uh, they did a great job. Um, there are opportunities for the community to be engaged with that. And so if you were to go out to Facebook or go out on to the internet and look for the Sheldon Nature Area uh, Committee, um, you would find a way to get involved. And if anyone out there wants to be engaged in helping repair the biodiversity that's lost by the removal of the elm trees and creating a more diverse tree population, um, you can also call the Teresa Duran at the um, Oshkosh Area School District Foundation and make a contribution, a financial contribution in that way as well. So um, anything will help. So. Thank you with that. Um, was there any questions anyone want to make a comment about their experience? No? I Go would ahead. just like to thank Teresa Duran for helping to organize those tours and also to Steve Mawson and Terry Steele who have been involved with that nature area for many, many years. Um, and it's been a linchpin of the Oakwood Environmental Charter School for these many years and the community does use it. It's not uh, lot, strictly yeah. used by the mm -hmm. school district, although that's its primary uh, emphasis, but um, a, g a good reminder to all of us that this is another part of our facilities mm -hmm. of the school district. Absolutely. And so it was a great night. Thanks, thanks yep. to those people for making it possible. Mm -hmm. All right, and lastly, my last, um, I guess, kind of board president information is the future board priority workshops. Um, uh, Sherry has sent out uh, a, a survey for potential dates for us to have two meetings, one in September, one in October. Um, these are a continuing of our, continu of, our, of our continuous improvement that we've been working on as a board. Um, and um, I think it was last month, either in June or July, um, we came to an agreement to, to build um, some uh, plan around community engagement and data-driven decision-making. 
Um, and so, uh, so the goal is, is that in September that we would have a meeting about community engagement, uh, a workshop, and that we would come out of that meeting with, uh, with a plan specifically. Um, the way that we're advising to do that is that uh, Patty Vickman and Cheryl Stinsky are going to provide us information up front and in advance of that meeting so that we can digest and look at that information and come prepared with ideas to create a plan from and, and to create goals and outcomes from that. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's the intention is that we would leave that workshop with a plan that we have agreed upon uh, to, to execute as a board. So um, if you haven't responded to Sherry's request for dates, please do that. So, um, and that's all I, I have related to that. So, thank you for your time on listening to my longly worded report. <laughs> so, next up is our superintendent's report, uh, Dr. Davis. Great. All right, our uh, good news report um, tonight starts with our uh, prep for the upcoming school year. So our administrators from across the district recently came together for impactful professional development and collaboration. Um, so I want to thank uh, Ted Knightsky um, at CESA 6 um, to help uh, uh, facilitate uh, our process uh, around continuous improvement um, that's, that was launched on August uh, 2nd and, and will um, be uh, um, sessions he'll facilitate with our administrators through November. Uh, so just want to thank him for his work uh, in the countdown to the school year begins. So uh, we can't wait to get out and uh, get all of our students and staff here. So uh, exciting, exciting times. Uh, some updates from the uh, from our summer programming. Uh, over the summer, nearly 70 Oshkosh North students participated in the Girls Strength, Agility, and Conditioning Summer Program, which took place uh, four days a week. Uh, we're excited to see all their hard work pay off this fall. Special thanks to our partners at Ascension Health for organizing the beneficial program for our student athletes. Our Project Search uh, site recently received an Excellent Employment Outcome Award for achieving 70 to 90 percent intern employment for our 2021 school year. Um, program leaders recently attended a Project Search National Conference in Baltimore and received the award. This was the program's fourth employment award, so congratulations to all those involved uh, for this valuable program and we're so proud of the students. Uh, who have embraced the experiences and entered the community as incredible employees. So congratulations to everyone involved there. As been mentioned many times, um, but uh, we'll continue to toot our own horn. Uh, the Brewing Futures Mobile Cafe uh, was busy connecting with people, uh, in this case from all over the world, um, as they served attendees at EAA. Uh, students and staff were able to celebrate with an incredible soon-to-be pilot, Nathan, who stopped by the truck to share his story. Nathan is in the process of earning his wings through Abled Flight. Abled Flight provides scholarships for people with varying disabilities to provide the experience of piloting aircraft and working in aviation. Nathan, Nathan, Nathan was certainly an inspiration uh, to the students who loved meeting him. So congratulations to everyone there and good luck to Nathan as we move, he's moving forward. Uh, many of our students and staff uh, also made time to serve uh, our community during, the, during EAA, including the communities program um, at Oshkosh North uh, High School. So we love being part of the Oshkosh community. So thanks for volunteering your time uh, during that busy week. Uh, throughout the district, um, we've got a lot of staff members who are uh, also collaborating and getting ready for the start of the school year. Our school secretaries spent a day of learning and training together. Uh, we're grateful for all of, the, all of them that could do that and who serve our students, staff, families, and community on a daily basis. Uh, these smiling faces are eager to see everyone back in their buildings. So it was a great start to the year. Uh, next Tuesday, the district is hosting a job fair um, with on-the-spot interviews and, uh, and leaders available to answer questions. Uh, we are seeking to fill a variety of positions with immediate start dates, including teachers, teachers' assistants, substitutes, special education, custodial, food service, and more. If you're looking for a job or considering a career move, uh, we'd love to meet you and help uh, under you understand what our district has to offer. Uh, if you're not looking for new, for new employment opportunity, you can still help us by spreading the word and sharing this opportunity with everyone you know. So please help us with that. 
And, uh, and then uh, just the list of the uh, busy activities um, that we've had, uh, that I've had throughout the, uh, the past month. So again, it's been, a, been an active time and uh, a, I think a very good summer uh, for us to uh, uh, always refine our work and uh, be ready to go for the upcoming school year. So that concludes the uh, Superintendent's Good News Report for tonight. Great, thank you, Dr. Davis. Uh, next up, we have District Administrator Supplemental Reports. Um, first one is the COVID-19 update uh, by Mr. Kamer. Good evening. Good evening. So the only piece of my report I'm going to report out on this evening is the most recent Winnebago County uh, COVID-19 update. So based on that update, um, which came out last week Thursday, the, the case rate at that time was 237.5, which placed our, our district geographical area in the medium risk category. So I believe that was the first time we were in the medium risk category since they came out with a new criteria. Um, in terms of cases for those under the age of 18, uh, we're at 23 for that seven day time period. Of those, uh, 10 of the individuals were below five, six of them were between the ages of five and nine, Three of them were between the ages of 10 and 14, and four of them were between the ages of 15 and 17. So uh, that was pretty much it in the county report. I did want to mention that uh, we're finalizing our, our district plan for this upcoming school year, and we are gonna be communicating that out to our, our staff, students, and families uh, later this week or early next. And we'll have a more thorough report on that, uh, some of the handbook changes at our next board meeting. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, we have um, a budget variance ESSER funds update by Mr. Nihans. Good evening. Hi. So the, the budget report, um, I'm just going to hit some highlights here. Uh, this report does include the wrapping up of our fiscal year. So the numbers are um, pretty solid, but we're still going through uh, beginning the audit. Uh, we have the auditors here next week. So the numbers will change slightly um, from this, but this is a pretty good indication of where we ended up the fiscal year. So our fund 10, the general budget, uh, we were a little over 1% better than budget, uh, which translates to approximately a $4.3 million surplus. So that surplus, we're in a spot in the district where we don't need to add the fund balance anymore. So we are gonna be transferring that to our fund 46, which is the capital improvement fund. By doing that, we'll increase our state aid by a little bit more than $600,000. Um, Cause state aid comes in based on expenses. So th this is a, not only do we uh, put some money away for some capital improvement needs and in a separate budget, but it, it captures more state aid, which is always a good thing. That helps lower, lower property taxes. Um, let's see, one thing, and the report, we have Fund 80. Fund 80 is our recreation department, and they did have a deficit for this year, um, but that was, that was known, and actually it's been requested by DPI and our auditor that we start um, spending our balance down, our overall surplus, um, is still going to be about $1.4 million in that fund. So um, Mr. Helmbrick and I have been working on upgrading some equipment and making some investments back into the um, different programming that we do offer to, to spend some of that down. DPI would really like that uh, less than a million dollars. So over the next couple years, you'll uh, more than likely continue to see some deficit end of year um, spending from, from the rec department until we get to a, a little bit better balance in that, that fund. The ESSER fund, we didn't see a change in that report. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing our final claim. Uh, we'll be putting in about a $4.2 million claim here at the end of this week, uh, which means we will be carrying over about half a million dollars into this next fiscal year. Uh, we do, do still have another year to spend that ESSER two money, so we're well within compliance, but uh, we are gonna carry about a half a million over in that fund. The health and the dental plans continue to run um, ahead of schedule. Um, both, are, both are doing one well. The health plan's at a little bit less than a 60 loss ratio, and the dental plan's at 92. 
So that means expenses are running 60% of what our premiums are, um, or in the dental, it's 92% of premiums. So both continue to run really well halfway through a, the calendar year. Are there any questions on, on any of the reports? Go ahead. Um, I think I missed it. Did you give us a number for the fund 80 deficit for the rec department? I'm sorry, I didn't. It, oh. It's going to be about 275000 so I think if the, the average taxpayer watching, since we mentioned that we'll be putting some of these funds back in so that we can lower property taxes, um, I, would you guess that they would see a an, an decrease in their property taxes as a result of our surplus this year? Uh, a decrease in the property taxes because of the surplus? Um, the property taxes, really, the tax levy is based in um, October right. when we set the levy. So that really doesn't have an impact on our surplus other than the fact that because we are going to utilize the surplus and put it into Fund 46, the $600,000 of extra aid is going to give us more state money, which means $600,000 less in property tax. Right. Now, to a homeowner, that's probably not going to amount to, to much more than a few pennies um, in the big scheme. Um, but it is still, we, we've shifted in the district to where um, w right now we're looking at the state funding about 63% of our budget, where five, six years ago that was more in the 57, 58% range. So we, we've increased over the last five, or five to seven years, we've increased state aid and de decreased what our property taxes are by about five to seven percent. I asked that question, I kind of knew the answer to it already, but I asked that question so to be clear that the average taxpayer, even though we have a surplus, it doesn't impact the tax levy. They're two separate things. So thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Um, thanks for the report. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, it's good to hear that the rec department's going to be able to replace some equipment. Um, and I believe that as we continue to um, become more and more uh, in a better fiscal spot. Do we have equipment like replacement plans and lists? Schedules? Schedules? Yes, we do. So that we're continually replacing stuff as needed? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Some, with the rec department, it's, we, for instance, the, the rec gym itself, um, the district hadn't been sure what was going to go on in that building, so we hadn't changed the basketball hoops. Um, we're able to, even if we, the district decides in the, the near future to abandon that building and, and move the rec department, that's something that we can take with us. So that was kind of an investment that we saw as it's, it's not a short term and then it, it goes away. So we're trying to do those kind of equipment upgrades right now. The other thing the rec department's involved in is the, the turf field at north, um, the tennis courts at west, and then we're um, looking at uh, turf field at West as well. So they'll be involved in assisting funding those projects. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I only ask because I've been doing some reading and um, part of staying a good organization, staying on top of equipment and not getting all kinds of outdated stuff is, from what I've been reading, is to have really good, you know, replacement schedules on different things. So I just wanted to check and make sure that that's something that was part of the process. So yep. thank you. Appreciate You're welcome. It. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. So none. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Our next report is a referendum update and summer projects update from Mr. Fox. Good evening. Good evening. So today is an opportunity. Uh, for us once again to take a look at where we are with regard to Vell Phillips and the, the progress of the construction at that particular site. So since our last board meeting, uh, some significant changes have taken place, as, as many of you are well aware driving by. Uh, paving of the parking lot has occurred. Uh, curb, gutter, light pole bases are all installed. Uh, that may be difficult to see, but from Kentucky you can see through the fence. We've got about two-thirds of the parking lot paved. It is just a base course at this point. It'll be the top court will be paved once we near the end of the project and completed closer to the building. 
Uh, Myron continues on concrete footings, foundation walls. I feel like we've been having this conversation for about five months. Uh, they are nearing completion. They are on the far south side of that facility now, working on band choir orchestra, and ultimately uh, we'll discuss the field house as they migrate into that area. Uh, continuation of underground sanitary piping, electrical, that all follows your foundational work, of course, as we had discussed. Structural steel installation is pretty exciting. Uh, they've, been, they've been really uh, going to town on structural steel and, and kind of moving across the building. You're seeing the first floor uh, complete in probably a, you know, a third of the footprint, and they're moving up to second floor in certain areas. Spancrete flooring has followed the structural steel installation in that uh, first floor area, cafeteria area, and then they've been pouring their top coat on that as well. We'll have pictures for that in the future. It's difficult to get into that area right now. So as you can see in the upper left, uh, that is a look from the, from the school at the future parking lot for staff. Um, lower left is an inside picture. You can see the um, um, ceiling, what we call a pan deck, uh, structural steel. You can see all the infrastructure going in underneath the ground for uh, this particular area happens to be um, looking at steam <coughs> stem area from the cafeteria. Uh, in the center are some, some footings on the south side. That, that's a wall for band choir orchestra. And on the, on the far right side, again, you'll see representations of structural steel, uh, a future second floor hallway in the upper right, and then a, what will become a classroom in the lower right. I've gotten ahead of myself just a little bit, but um, uh, Again, representations of the, in the top left, uh, future classrooms in, in section A, exterior walls uh, that we're gonna discuss in, in the center, top center. You can see Myron is, uh, they're framing out the uh, openings to receive windows, which is going to occur in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they'll start anyhow. Upper right, you'll see more structural steel gains. A lot of uh, activity happening in the main commons area right now. Is, is probably the bulk of their structural steel activity as they go vertical. Uh, on the lower left, you'll see the structural steel, but in the foreground is actually the storage area in the structural piece for that large learning staircase that we saw so many times in many of our discussions. So uh, keep your eye on that. That's, that's probably the focal point of the entire school for, for quite a while. Um, and then on the lower right, is structural steel going vertical in section A. A little, little difficult to tell what it is right now, but eventually you'll see the, the second floor in steel and span creed and they'll, they'll be migrating up to the third. So what are they doing in the next 30 days? Um, as we had said, they will continue with the footings, uh, structural foundation walls for band choir orchestra, uh, followed by block walls uh, through the administrative area. They will continue working on electrical conduits, underground, um, supporting systems. So as those areas go vertical, uh, they don't have to try to dig underneath those areas with new walls. Uh, you will see the continuation of installation of structural steel. They're going to migrate from, you know, the, the tower area A over to B and then, and then administration. Uh, you'll see a continuation of span creek decking across second floor as they try to finish second floor ultimately in a couple of months and then work their way toward third. Um, and in the next couple of weeks they will start pouring concrete at grade level. So some of the pictures I had shown you were future classrooms, representative of future classrooms that are all still gravel. And I anticipate in the next several weeks we will see all those poured with concrete floors. Mm. Any questions on the progress? current progress or what's happened to date or what will be happening at the Villa Phillips site. Um, could you please remind the community when the opening date is? And the reason I'm asking this question is my, my son was home from college and we drove by. And first of all, he was impressed, like, wow, this is going to be amazing. But then he said, mom, they are so far behind. How are they going to be open <laughs> in September? And I said, they're not opening in a couple of months. So <laughs> when is the opening date? Again, can you remind the community, please? Substantial completion is the August, is it August 10th? 
Um, it's the first week in August. Yeah. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head of next. Yeah. But it is um, not. 2023. In 2023. Right. 2023. 2023, 2023 yes. It, it, we are not behind schedule. We are all. on, <laughs> Myron is on schedule. Uh, substantial completion is is a unique number because we will actually be transitioning in with, with furniture and a great many things just prior to that and throughout the entire month of August. But we are on track to begin school on time in 2023 at Bill Phillips. It's amazing. And just driving by there and seeing the progress is so exciting. And so I urge anyone who has not driven by it to drive by it. And, and I dare you not to get a swell in your belly of pride that we are just building a new school and it's a long time coming. So thank you both for all your hard work on that. At one point we had talked about uh, seating inside and then taking some seating out and I was wondering if there have been any changes or were we able to add some seating back in to be able to accommodate the students that are going there. Are you referring to the bleachers? Yes. Uh, we have not had any conversation with regard to the bleachers. However, remember that we, we do have all the infrastructure and we've got the space to support the bleachers. So. At any given time, whether that occurs in the next couple of months or the next year or beyond, that we decide to move on that bleacher system, no changes need to be made in the construction to receive that. I don't want to speak on behalf of district administration, but one of the biggest unknowns in building a new building is understanding what's below grade. We can do testing and things like that beneath the soil, but until you're actually digging it up and understanding what's suitable, what is not, and the dollars associated to that, um, I think there might have been some strategy in letting all the foundations get in and, and kind of recalibrating. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kearns. So to go with that, does that mean that we had that list a few months back on our um, incredibly long meeting where a lot of the items that were looking to be pulled out, does that mean that that did happen or was that just stuff that was going to be potentially? Is that what you're referring to right now is that stuff is still open for figuring that out as we go I would do you well want, yeah on. I mean so as Nate has said um, some of those items were removed from they're removed from scope but we understand where they are for example the bleachers um, you know we've got the infrastructure we we built the building to hold those bleachers we are uh, we're still incurring costs for underground extra underground work which which was budgeted but we don't ultimately know where that number is going to land um, we've got we've got some budget for unknown costs associated with the building but ultimately we don't know what those costs are going to represent on a final dollar amount so a lot of those items that we had identified are going to continue to sit until we have a better understanding of what the true cost of this entire building is rather than putting ourselves in a bad fiscal position with that building by trying to put some of these items back into scope too early and that's why I want to make sure you understand that, yes, we've identified the item and, and we've got a place for them. We just, we just don't know yet where they'll fall within the project or if they'll fall post-project. Okay. That makes sense. I have one other thing I wanted to say. Um, just speaking of the, the name, I, I guess you guys all know how much the, the name of the school meant to me. Um, but it's been very cool to see the community really embrace the name and just talking to different people and different entities it's just starting to just roll off the tongue and it's um, it's just it's very cool to see so any other thanks for all the questions thanks for the report thank, thank, you. You. thank you all right next up we have our final district administrator supplemental report uh, it's key indicators for literacy being led by Miss Conrad Miss Brown and Ms. Kuha. Well, good evening. Um, so as reported last time, Julie had done a presentation on some of the key indicators and the assessments that we would be using, such as the phonological awareness assessment, which you might have hear, heard as PALS, the reading I ready, and then also, of course, our Wisconsin Forward. Um, and then, of course, there were also goals set with each of those. But what we really want to highlight tonight is some of the really exciting work that's happening in our district right now, and we're going to let Dr. Kuhop talk about that. Yes, so, so really we just, we're off and running since our last meeting that we came to talk about since the audit, the strategic report. And so we are, we have everything scheduled in. We are just 
concluding this week our Early Literacy Academy that we have um, our all our literacy leaders, including our instructional support teachers, and for literacy and our principals. And it has been fabulous. Um, we've had um, the principals have been there for half the day of the training with Diana Kresovic from C from CISA 6, uh, who's done a great job facilitating us. Um, and then in the afternoon, I've worked with the literacy instructional um, team um, on working on how do we then use this information and get it to our our classroom teachers. So we've been planning our year out, and you see it in the report too, of how we're going to be looking at the shifts that we make, very high leverage shifts within our instruction um, as part of that plan. So that is, that's really, we, we finished tomorrow, um, not tomorrow, I'm sorry, we finished Friday. Um, so we had three days last week. We have two days this weekend. We had an extra bonus day to um, today that was a webinar that was um, with Dr. Jan Birkins, who is the writer of The Six Shifts, The Balance of, of Literacy, and it was fabulous um, work that we, we got to take part in as well. Awesome. Any questions? I have a question. It's not necessarily about this, but it's the three of you. Wondering <laughs> about uh, the Washington program, the, the summer school program, and remedial work. Can you give us any update um, on the success of the program this summer? I have not yet. I, I actually, I have not yet heard. I know mm -hmm. they, the teachers were very excited about continuing mm -hmm. that from the success they had last year. Um, and so I have not looked at data or anything yet, but uh, yeah, I'm excited. I have a little bit of a preview. Okay. So, oh, good. Um, so Kat Noble, who is our new principal at Washington Elementary School and was teaching and was teaching in summer climb prior to her appointment. Um, what she has reported out that it has been very successful and it's been very successful in as they're working with students, they are seeing them maintain um, their current like reading level from where they were in the spring and pulling it forward because what we're really after is mitigating that slide, right? So we've all heard the term summer slide. So it's really about preventing that slide and they're super excited about like processes, procedures, how um, your cadence as a student, they're not starting from scratch on day one. Kindergarten and first grade students are going to be coming in immediately ready to, to learn. And so those are the two big things that they're seeing as a success right now is absolutely no slide and being ready to learn on day one. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for the question and thank you for the report. I'm sorry, I just go wanted ahead, to comment really quickly that I really appreciated <coughs> the link that you provided in our board packet for the success criteria pertaining to grade level. Mm -hmm. I think that helps us all know a little bit more about what we mean when we talk about literacy. Mm -hmm. So thank you for including that link. It was really valuable. I had one other thing too, and it was the very last link that you talked about, uh, the webinar. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the name of that again? And the person who did it and the, and the title. Yes, it, it, so it was the webinar we, so it was a, it was done through CISA 6, it was part of our Early Literacy Academy, so Dr. Jan Birkins was, and she's the author of the, um, the sh shift, shifting the balance, shifting the balance, and so she spoke to us for three hours this morning in a, in a synchronous environment okay. for that. Oh yes, and then Wiley Blevins, who was another, is another one who has been working a lot with um, CISA six as well as nationwide on and working on what are our pitfalls for phonics instruction. And so we've used his text to to center us. And then we've all all of the leaders we have um, homework that we are ready for tomorrow of of watching his hour and a half video on um, what are those pitfalls and how do we how do we plan forward for that. I'm really happy to see this report. Uh, we've, in my estimation, we've elevated literacy to the extent that we've built in uh, a focus on results as part of policy. And so I think that should be an indication we take this very seriously. And we really want to see, <coughs> excuse me, each child grow at least one year each year. Um, this is so critical to student success now and into the future that 
Um, I look forward to future reports updating the board on what's happening and the great successes we're seeing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, I wasn't informed of any committee reports from any from any board members, so um, I think we're just going to move forward. Uh, so no reports there. Um, do we know if we have anyone signed up for a public forum? So normally at this point of the meeting, we would provide an opportunity for the public uh, to engage us on non-agenda related public uh, items um, or agenda related uh, public forum. So there is no one signed up to provide either of those in those comments. And so in those situations, uh, we skip over that portion and we move on to the next part of the agenda. So uh, that leads us to workshops. Uh, tonight's workshop is titled Alternative Education Plan Update, and it's led by Mr. Kamer. Hello again. <clears throat> I am going to invite Andrea Fisher to join me up here. Um, Andrea has been our, our program coordinator of our Second Chance program for the past three years. And uh, she's going to be transitioning to our new alternative education program, uh, which is True Academy. So she'll be the coordinator there. And a majority of our presentation tonight is going to be focused on our, our new alternative education program. So before I get into that, I have a few slides to go over quick about our PK through 12 supportive and alternative education plan. Um, Dictated by state statute, every year our district has to review and establish the criteria that we use to identify a student as at risk. So as a part of that, uh, we also have to identify how we're going to support <coughs> students who are identified at risk within our district. So that's really what this report lays out. Um, the plan itself um, was, was established in 2014. And the structure of that plan hasn't changed since then. Each year we go back, we have a committee take a look at it and really update anything that's changed, whether that be within state statute or just simply within our district. So I'm not going to go over the, the uh, plan in great detail just because it's available uh, for the public to see. But um, I'll just scroll through it quick so you can kind of see or have a better idea what it all entails. But the first part really includes our, our demographic demographics and philosophy, goals and objectives, applicable laws and statutes related to alternative education. Um, section five is where we identify our district criteria for identifying students as at risk. And most of that is aligned with the state statutes for that identification. Section, section six uh, lays out how we notify parents anytime we identify a student as at risk. Uh, program or uh, uh, section seven identifies the programs and services that we have in place to support our students and I'm gonna spend most of my time in this section touching on this I'm gonna go back to it here shortly um, section eight identifies how we're gonna monitor the progress of students uh, who are uh, participating in our alternative programming And then section nine details how we're going to evaluate our programs. And then section 10 identifies relevant district policy. So that's it in a nutshell. In terms of what we changed this time around, there really wasn't a whole lot. We updated the demographics in the first section. And then in section 8.3, we added IXL, which is a progress monitoring tool we already had identified at the high school level, but we're also using at the, at the middle school level. So we made sure that we added that to that portion. Um, the pro program matrix, which I'll show you in a second, is the area that really houses all of our programs, services, and supports that we offer as a district. So each year we update that as well. 
this time around we removed crossroads and second chance programs um, and I'll get into why we did that here shortly but essentially we're combining those two programs to form what is now called True, Acad True Academy which is one of the programs we actually added. We removed Mentor 2.0 uh, which was an online mentoring program that was um, affiliated with Project Phoenix at North High School and the reason we removed that is uh, over the past uh, year we've had more difficulty securing mentors through that program and a lot of the curriculum that was used through Mentor 2.0 uh, overlapped with Project Phoenix curriculum so there, there was deemed to be no longer a need for that. And then our RISE program at Carl Traeger Middle School is no longer in place because the students who were in that program have moved on to the high school. So in addition to True Academy, some of the things that were added was Fundamentals, and that's a, um, a partner program, it's a community program. Uh, they provide educational services to students who have significant social, emotional, behavior, or mental health needs. Uh, we added Latira, which is a, um, a virtual literacy intervention. Uh, we added the Pride team at North High School, which is the student version of the PBIS team. And then finally, we added Ingenuity, the, the general curriculum. We already used Ingenuity from a credit recovery standpoint, but we just added in the uh, initial credit version as well. And again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going through our program matrix because it is available uh, to anybody who wants to see it. Um, but this first part here identifies uh, programs that involve community collaborations. And as you can see, the, the list is, is fairly extensive. And then the second part are more OESD-oriented programs. So again, you'll find anything that we do in the district right on this matrix. So that concludes uh, the update of our actual plan. Um, like I said, the, the most of uh, the bulk of what we want to talk about tonight is our new alternative education program called True Academy, which stands for Teach, Restore, Understand, and Educate. So for this portion, we're going to talk a little bit about the mission of the program, how we have the program structured, including our staffing, how we place students within the, pro in the program, and how long they're going to be placed, um, how we're going to uh, foster homeschool communication with those students and transition them back in a timely manner, requirements for the program, and then um, talk about how students could ultimately be removed from the program. So in terms of our program mission, really what we want to do is collaborate with all stakeholders, so not only students and families um, and staff members, but also have community collaborations built into this. And really the, the idea is that through these, these collaborations with all stakeholders, we're going to be able to successfully transition students back to their home school so they can be successful there, but also beyond high school. So by doing that, we're going to uh, make sure that we're implementing a relevant and engaging curriculum that allows for credit attainment. But one of the things that you'll also hear is that there's going to be a therapeutic underlay within this program. So a lot of it is going to be focused very heavily on social emotional learning and helping students build the skills they need to be successful back at their home school. There, there is a, a great deal of emphasis on family and community connections as well, as you will hear. <coughs> and then, like I said, our focus is really on high school success and beyond. And the positioning, um, just to be clear, the, the, uh, and Matt will go through this in a second, but um, this is the program that previously we've talked about an abeyance program for our expulsion. Um, students so this is the true Academy is what the advanced program is um, so we needed to come up with a name so just to make sure we're making that transition from some of our previous conversations to uh, to where we are now yeah thank you that was a perfect segue all right so in terms of our, our target population for the program there are really two ways that that students can be placed within our program so the first is students who have traditionally been second chance students so these are students who have an IEP in place and um, as a part of that IEP have behavioral needs that go beyond what can be supported within the traditional school setting. So these are students who may have been in the EBD program, in a self-contained program, and have been unsuccessful within that program. And then the other population that we're targeting are students who um, have committed an expellable offense. And um, those would typically be students who would go through our Crossroads program. The big difference is 
in order to get into Crossroads, students had to be expelled from the district. So um, essentially what this does by combining, combining second chance and Crossroads, we move that Crossroads component to the front end of the expulsion process. So really, um, in the event a student commits an expellable offense, there are three avenues that we can take as a district now. Um, the first avenue and the, the probably the most common is we can send the student back to their home school on a, a contract of some sort with behavioral stipulations requiring them to do XYZ in order to remain in good standing within the school. The next avenue would be to uh, enroll within True Academy and the idea is that we would help students build the skills necessary to return to that home school setting um, hopefully within a semester. And then finally, the last avenue would be go, go to expulsion immediately. And those would be for offenses that are so egregious that we couldn't really have a student participate in True Academy. So some of the benefits of consolidating these two programs, uh, we now have more staff in one location to really support all of these students. Um, and that's not only academically, but also behaviorally and social emotionally. Um, by having this on the front end, students will no longer have an expulsion on their record in order to get into a program like this, be able to transition back. Um, the focus is really going to be on skill building. Students are still going to be able to earn credits, obviously, but really, like I said, that underlying therapeutic component is really going to be the most important part of this program. And there's really going to be a strong emphasis on engagement with the home schools. So you'll see here shortly that we do have embedded within this program opportunities for administrators from the home schools and also the counselors from the home schools to maintain relationships with those students to help ease that transition back. <coughs> so the location of the program is going to continue to be at our second chance building which is 215 Wagu Street. Uh, the building itself has three classrooms, two offices, and uh, a large common area. So there is sufficient space to house a program like this. Uh, in terms of how the program is going to be structured, there are two sessions. So there's a morning session and an afternoon session, each of which are three hours in length. And each of those sessions is going to have a max capacity of 15 students. So really for the entire program, we should be able to accommodate 30 students at any given time. <clears throat> one thing, one advantage that we do have by having two different sessions is that with a counseling piece involved with this, we do have the option of keeping students or having them be a part of the opposite session to engage in some of the counseling work so it doesn't really fear with that academic time as well. Um, traditionally at Second Chance we have a certified art teacher who comes on a regular <coughs> basis to provide um, uh, education in the area of art, but we also have content teachers in the core academic areas of English, math, science, and social studies. So in order to supplement that, we do, we're going to be doing a lot of community outings and have partnerships with um, those within the community to, to have a lot of hands-on experiential learning opportunities for these students. And then we can also offer supplemental instruction through our Ingenuity Online program. So if, if you remember what I mentioned before about now having the initial credit version of Ingenuity, that's going to provide us with the opportunity to allow these students to take additional electives through Ingenuity. Um, if they've failed, failed classes in the past, they can also take the credit recovery version as well. And one of the benefits of this program as well is all students are transported to the program and then back home. So that really helps out with attendance. Uh, we have a number of vans that our staff are going to be driving each day to, to pick up and drop off our kids. In terms of staffing, um, we have our full-time program coordinator, which is Andrea. We also have a, a full-time school counselor we've hired and uh, will be joining us to start the school year. We have two special education teachers that are going to be coming over from our Second Chance staff. Um, we have an English alternative education teacher and a math alternative education teacher. Um, both of them are, are currently listed as temporary positions, but um, there is going to be a resolution coming <coughs> next week to make those permanent positions uh, to create more stability within the program. We have a half-time school social worker who is also going to be coming over from our Second Chance program. And then we're also working with Rawhide to have on-site clinical therapy available for the students in the program. In terms of student placement, there are two different ways students can be placed depending on their current situation. So 
Students who uh, have an IEP and would have traditionally been placed at Second Chance can still enter the program the same way they always have. So as I mentioned before, those would be students who may have been unsuccessful in a self-contained EBD program and just need additional support. So as long as um, Andrea is on board as well as the rest of the IEP team, we could place a student within the program. The other avenue to enter the program is through the pre-expulsion process. So we have a student who's committed an expellable offense. Rather than proceeding to expulsion, um, they would be placed in the program as an abeyance of that process. Um, we would want to make sure that whatever offense was committed, it wasn't so egregious that it would jeopardize the, the safety of the students or staff who are in the program. So that's one thing we want to make sure of. Um, and then also I mentioned one of the other avenues would be through that pre-expulsion process would be just to have the student return to their school um, on a, some sort of behavioral contract. So placement within True Academy is voluntary. So uh, when we're having conversations with parents and students, it will ultimately be up to them if they want to participate. Now, the alternative will likely be going to expulsion, but we really want to make sure that students um, understand what the expectations are upon enrolling in the program and are invested and bought into doing well to earn their way back into the regular school setting. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can you go back a slide so I don't forget it? Um, oh. So, sorry. Oh, no, but it's fine. The, um, so it's there, it's voluntary if they decide to go that route. So going through the abeyance program instead of going to the expulsion hearing, I'm guessing that in this situation, it would be you go to expulsion, you're trying to fight against it to stay in your home school, or you're out of the district if you take it to that point. Whereas currently, before we got to this point, it was if you did were expelled, then you were able to go to Crossroads, right? Mm -hmm. And now if you get to that point, you decide to go to expulsion, it's an, it's an, it's an all or nothing kind of a thing, right? Is that where we're? So with, within the pre-expulsion meeting, we have those three avenues to go down. Okay. So really, um, Dr. Jones, our director, of, our executive director of administration, really drives that process and works with the building administrators to try to figure out what makes the most sense. Okay. Um, like I said, if, if at all possible, we try to keep our students in our home schools, but um, there does come a time where it's, it's just not working. Yeah. So that's where you know, this, this is an opportunity for students to, like I said, prove that they can get their way yeah. back into that school setting. but. If they don't want to take advantage of it, yeah. um, we, we don't want to put them in a program where uh, they're not invested in going into it or, or <coughs> not going to want to be successful to begin with. I guess maybe I didn't ask it right or, or, or say it, but if they decide not to take that opportunity and they decide to take it to the expulsion hearing, mm -hmm. then if that comes back as being expelled, there is no there is no safety net there anymore. There is no other program that they're a part of. That's so that would be a discussion at the expulsion hearing. Okay, you know, we could we could offer um, you know potentially an online option. You know, okay. again, depending on what the situation was with the student. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's different than it was than it was. That's before. what I'm trying to understand. Is that it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. different proposition. We get to that point now. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say it's all or nothing, but it's certainly different and a different level of, of support <coughs> that we provide. Okay. Again. Trying to work our way upstream, yeah. you know, um, for for students and their families. And I'm sure you guys do a great job. I mean, that's that's all winding that up, right? Here are mm -hmm. the options, and here's here's what we recommend. Right. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Point of clarification, just to be clear, the board will be presented with expulsion, um, pre-expulsion um, next steps, and the the. the I'm not saying this right. The contract that's created or if the pre-expulsion is going to be done at not at the board level. It is not going to be the school board that's deciding the contract and everything. It's that's going to be a recommendation from like Dr. Jones and the pre-expulsion team. Correct? That's correct. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Similar and that's similar to our process now. Even right. the, the difference is um, prior to in order to get to like second chance then we, you know, we would right. need to go through the expulsion process with the board and then go to that program. Correct. Now we'd go from pre-expulsion, offer the program before going to expulsion, where a student wouldn't have that on their record right. and would have an opportunity to provide the services that, um, that many need to be able to re-engage back at the home school. Right, that and the board sense. will be provided um, the recommendations. That's the point of clarification I was looking for. Yeah. 
No. We would. Well, the board is pre expulsion, though. Right. Yes. Oh, that I'm sorry. It's for expulsion. Yeah. Yes. Correct. We will not, not be involved in pre expulsion. That's right. To yeah. clarify. The only, the only time that the board would be involved is if we do have a situation where it would go to expulsion. Okay. Um, and then we would work through a similar process that the board would see. Okay, that makes Just sense. The yeah. alternatives would be would be different. Right? Okay. So so maybe some online support would be yep. the most. We wouldn't have a another program then to be able to offer them on the back side of it because we've again we're trying to work so upstream that's awesome. know, for for them. In terms of our, our placement duration, our, like I said, our goal is really to transition students back into the homeschool setting. Um, as quickly as possible, but also uh, making sure that they're ready to transition back. So the idea is that if we have students placed within the pre-expulsion process, that they would remain within the program through the remainder of the current semester, as long as there's not 10 weeks or fewer remaining within that semester. So if there are 10 weeks or fewer remaining, they would also stay for the subsequent semester. So we don't want to transition students back at times other than at semester breaks, just because it's too difficult to come in midstream and try to catch up with content and figure things out within the classroom. Um, it's a little bit different for students who are placed in the program through the IEP process. Um, we, we don't have the ability to, to systematically change placement for a student with an IEP. So if a student um, you know, is, is within that program when we want to, when we think is a good time to transition them back, that would really involve coming together with the IEP team and uh, making that placement decision together. I mentioned before homeschool involvement is going to be a key piece to this. So we want to establish regular check-ins with school administrators. So uh, each month there's going to be a check-in where the school administrator is actually going to come on site and uh, meet with the students from their school uh, that are currently in the program. So the, the goal in that is really to maintain a positive relationship with that student. Uh, because when they do transition back, that, that the relationship is going to be key. Uh, but it also gives our administrators an opportunity to monitor that student's progress. And we have a very specific way we're going to be doing that as well. Um, and ultimately, like I said, our goal is to have a, a smooth, streamlined tr uh, transition back. And then our school counselors are also going to meet with students in the school on a regular basis. So these would be our home school counselors. And that allows them an opportunity to check in and, and make sure that our students are on track to earn the credits that they're taking and then once those credits are completed um, being ahead of the game so when that student transitions back they're you know set up with the right classes to try to make that a transition as seamless as possible uh, but also uh, like I said with that therapeutic underlay uh, we're really going to want to make sure that whatever strategies or SEL goals or tools that we're working with for those students is communicated back to our homeschool counselors so those can be uh, used with them upon their return as well. Um, in terms of program requirements, when each student enters the program, um, one of the first things that they're going to do is meet with our uh, True Academy counselor to begin creating a portfolio. And this portfolio is really going to touch on their individual requirements for the program uh, as well as their goals and accomplishments throughout their time in the program. So really it's a way for them to show their progress and growth uh, which is going to build the case for them to be back within their home school. So our, our uh, counselor within the program is really going to lead that process, but that portfolio then will be used, um, like I said, to, to show their, demonstrate to their building administrators that they are making the progress that we're hoping to see. In terms of other requirements for the program, uh, each student is required to earn at least three credits per semester. Uh, they're also required to maintain an attendance rate above 85% with us actually picking students up and dropping them off. Um, there really is no excuse for them not to hit that 85% threshold. Um, and we have a, an amazing school social worker that works out of our, our building as well that does a great job of working with families to eliminate any other barriers that, that may arise that impact attendance. Uh, students are also going to be required to attend a morning meeting each day. Obviously, for those in the afternoon session, the meeting wouldn't happen in the morning, but we still refer to it as morning meeting. Uh, that's a time for them to come together and build relationships with their classmates and also staff. Uh, each student is going to be required to participate in counseling that we have on site, either through the counselor or uh, through Rawhide. 
And then one requirement that we do have is that each student turns in their cell phone uh, prior to the start of their session each day. Um, obviously cell phones can be a huge distraction and uh, you know what we've seen is that uh, they can be the cause of a lot of drama as well um, in terms of students being on them and, and everything with social media. So to avoid all those headaches, um, students turn their phones on entrance. That's also a current practice we've done at Second Chance for many years, so it's already in effect for those kids. So question um, relates to the minimum of three credits. Mm -hmm. What's the maximum? So let's say the environmental change that's been created inspires a child to want to do better and to enhance and to build upon their portfolio. What's the, what's the highest amount of credits that they could, they, they could earn in that semester? So we don't really have a maximum. And I mean, with, with the credit recovery option through Ingenuity, I mean, there could be a student who has failed some classes in the past and is really motivated and uses that opportunity to, to earn back some of the credits that they missed in the past. So we don't want to limit students, but um, we also want to make sure that students are, are meeting the counseling requirements well and focusing in on some of those social emotional learning pieces sure. that, that may have been absent previously. So it's not just the focus on credits, it's also the, cro the focus on the person's needs Correct. that are that those resources that are being provided that they have access to that. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Got it. And the goal is the goal is not to build this program. The goal the goal is to have this be a place mm -hmm. where students can kind of gather themselves, yeah. get some services, and re-engage. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really important. And many times, and we had talked about this up front from our alternative programming. We want to make sure that that's our philosophy, and that that's really through Andrea's um, leadership and, and through our school buildings being engaged on a regular basis, we want to make sure that that continues to be, to be the focus. Now we hope this doesn't happen, but there inevitably is going to be a, a time when a student doesn't comply with our, our program rules or expectations, and we ultimately have to remove that student from the program. So. If it's a student who has an IEP, we would have to go through the IEP process, bring the team together and discuss placement, whether or not this is really the right placement for that student, or if there's somewhere else that would be more appropriate. For our students who are placed through the pre-expulsion process, um, upon removal, that student would be referred back to the Executive Director of Administration for next steps. So that could include uh, reinitiating the expulsion process at that time. There is an appeal process in place for students who are removed and then ultimately is appealed to Dr. Davis. Um, that is also written out in our handbook. So, question, maybe it's just a, a wording issue. Um, when it says may lead to reinitiating expulsion process, um, wouldn't, we, wouldn't we still go back to it being a pre-expulsion process? before determining that it's an expulsion process. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but that's not necessarily the case. So when, when students enter through the pre-expulsion process, they're actually agreeing to hold their expulsion in advance. So it doesn't go away, but there's, it's essentially put on pause. And in lieu of that, they're expected to achieve um, you know, their goals in, in completing this program to return back to the regular school setting. So if they're removed from the program, kind of unpause that expulsion mm. and okay. kind of go right back down that path. I, 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 I know what you're, I understand what you're saying. I, I guess I just look at that as, you know, if that student or family looks at that process saying this isn't working for me, or working not for me but for our child, um, if they're engaged even at that level, um, you know, the idea, you know, the alternative of online education and such like that. And so if we have that discussion at, are we also talking those, those opportunities like at that initial pre-expulsion phase as well? You yeah. know, those, those other alternatives. Uh, this is a great alternative, uh, but we also know that each kid and each family is, is going to be different in all of this. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's why we didn't say that if a student is removed, that they automatically revert back to the expulsion process. Uh, we kind of left it open-ended where that executive director of administration has the flexibility to determine next steps. So if the student really was engaged, maybe they've been doing amazing in that, their online work, but there's just something within the program that has been a struggle for them. I mean, that, that is an option 
Um, so we're not pigeonholed into automatically going right back to expulsion. Um, but like I said, that is one of the possibilities that could come out of it. And in the pre-expulsion process, we'll look at all alternatives. You know, anything that we, the idea is to be able to match what the student needs at that point in time. So sure. it may be this program, it may be something else. Um, so that'll be part of, that would be part of that process. Okay. And I think the important thing, and I think the, you know, I think that's one of the things when the board was starting to learn more about this process was that we, we wanted to make sure that as many options as possible were on the table prior to expulsion and that that was the focus of doing that. And so, um, so that clarification is, is really good. All right. Well, that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing um, where the new uh, True Academy program takes us. Uh, because obviously we don't want to have to expel any student if we don't have to so giving them another opportunity and wrapping them with some different services you know and seeing if that works so that we could potentially you know change their life and their family li family's life I think that that's a real exciting thing um, so I'm really looking forward to you know what the data tells us as far as you know how well the program works or doesn't work. And, you know, just like a long time ago, we, there wasn't drug court, you know? And now people are really adhering to the fact that, you know, drug court works to help give people a real chance and to be successful in society. Um, you know, these types of alternative programs, I believe in their own way, you know, can help provide people with, you know, students with another chance. So um, this is kind of, you know, some stuff I'm really familiar with, you know, it's because my first job out of uh, college was to work at Hami Home. So I'm real familiar with their model and Rawhide's, Rawhide's model and um, how, you know, you try to reach uh, youth with different types of programming. So. It'll, I'll just be really excited to see what, what the data tells us and what we learn, you know, and how this program could potentially grow, you know, to help us help more students because we're here for all students. And if we can reach a number of students through this al new alternative program, um, that'll be a really good thing. So. Thank you. And one of the benefits that we have is we're not necessarily starting from scratch. Um, Andrea's done an amazing job with our Second Chance program after over the past few years. So Absolutely. having her expertise as a part of this and really transitioning that program into this program is a, a huge benefit for us. Go ahead, Dr. Arzog. Thank you, Mr. Peschel. Um, ever since I've been on the board, the board has expressed concern over expulsions. Um, why we have them how effective is that? Um, how do we educate rather than focus on punishment? And I, I truly understand there are situations where a student may place him or herself in great um, danger from a physical standpoint as well as others. And so sometimes students have come to us who have maybe done one thing, but it was so egregious that we didn't feel from a safety standpoint they could <coughs> remain in their, their school. We've also had students who have come to us who maybe have violated school rules, many school rules for years and years, or who have had lots of absenteeism, or they've had grades that were pretty good and then they're not so good, and maybe some combinations of those. What I've always wondered about is how can we intervene at an earlier time so that we don't get those kinds of students coming to pre-expulsion and expulsion? Mm -hmm. Um, they don't necessarily pose a threat to themselves or others, but they're obviously not being successful. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but I'm just throwing that out there. I'm just mulling that over. One question I do have, we, over the past couple of years, have um, gone through expulsion hearings. We've accepted, we, for the most part, have accepted the recommendations of the hearing officers. And many times those students then have been assigned to crossroads for multiple years if they don't 
get it mm -hmm. together within a year. So what's going to happen to those students who over the last couple of years have been assigned to Crossroads for multiple years and now Crossroads is gone? What happens to those students? Yeah, that's a great question. So any student who was slated to be at Crossroads to start this next year will be transitioned into True Academy. So we're in the process of, of working with families to kind of grandfather them in. They'll still be working toward um, their expulsion contract or the reinstatement period. Um, for most of those students that would come up at end of first semester, um, there may be one or two that would be in a, a little bit longer than that, but um, we didn't want to just cast those students aside, so we are making exceptions to allow them in, um, at least initially, to, to start out. Okay. Another thing I've, I've wondered about is over the years with students who have come to us for expulsions, they've also included not only the attendance and the um, poor grades and, and so on and the violation of school rules I mentioned, but they've also in some cases um, had lots of suspensions. So I'm wondering at what point, because the board has talked about this in the past, and the board has also said they, we want to be data driven. Uh, in, as mm -hmm. decision makers. At what point would the board be receiving information on suspensions and expulsions over a period of time so that we can really look at those data? And we've also said that for various uh, staff reports and activities, we want to look at everything with the data, with, uh, excuse me, an equity lens. I didn't hear anything about equity uh, or disproportionality or inclusion or diversity. Uh, in the in this in the students who are serving or those who have been suspended or those who have been um, uh, taken to expulsion so I'm wondering at what point perhaps we can have an update on uh, historical data at least a five we need probably five years to look at a trend especially with the two years of intervening uh, <laughs> in and out of school with with the COVID cloud as I call it um, but I, I think that would be very helpful. I would find it helpful as a board member to see what those data look like in terms of suspensions and susp expulsions. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that every child who is suspended goes to expulsion, but we've had seen enough of them where they've been, there's been a history of suspensions and ultimately administration brings them to us for expulsion for what, what, whatever the offense is. So if we truly want to look at things through a diversity lens, I think this would be a place for us to start because there have been mm -hmm. so many questions raised over time about Agreed. disproportionality of what kinds of groups um, of students are, are falling into these disciplinary categories. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point. So uh, one of the things that I'll be bringing to the board uh, probably in October because we're working through the um, just the uh, committee process is a, a work plan um, and, and it'll be an annual work plan we'll, we'll have our workshops scheduled out so it's kind of teasing out our current workshops uh, from from our schedule uh, but making sure that within each one of those workshops uh, is a topic and a report and then within that report <coughs> is an equity section if you will where we'd show the disaggregation and uh, you know and what we would be working on toward from an equity perspective so that'll be baked into each one of those reports so it, for example, when we're sitting here in a year, whenever the alternative uh, program comes up on that schedule, then we'd be able to get a report out on who are the stu students and families that were served through our alternative ed process, what does that look like, who are they, are we seeing patterns, um, things that we can use to inform our programming or our instruction on the front end of that. Right. So that would be specific for the alternative ed program. Um, when we're talking about um, suspensions, so going up upstream a little bit um, from, from an pre-expulsion process. Um, we'll also um, you know, be taking a look at our suspension and our behavior data in that same lens. That, that will be separate from the alternative ed uh, report, but it would be more around like student wellness. Okay. So how are we doing? But you know, behavior is an indication that students may not be well. Um, and so we'll have an annual report that we'll have a report on our suspension trends, um, looking at that over time, um, and then talking about what we're doing to be able to uh, just, again, continuously improve our, our programming and processes. So, so I'll come with a schedule in October, okay. and that will then just set us on a trajectory where we'll have a really sustainable, predictable time when we'll have our data presented, and it'll allow the board to have a workshop to where we can really dig in and ask some good questions, that it's not just a, a report and you know, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a flyby type of thing, so, um, so we can dig in. That for us, from, our, from a programming standpoint, for myself and our directors, 
is really important then to be able to have you know the, the board's feedback on, on where we're at with those programs so uh, but to be able to do that in a really predictable sustainable way is important uh, because we're all asked for data all the time right we can't go to the grocery store without <laughs> asked being asked like hey what about this what about this so we want a place to be able to all of that is important but we want a place to put it um, and so when we have the calendar, it'll be a place to put it so we know that we'll be able to stay on top of our programs um, at that system level. Also. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis. Yeah. Go ahead. This Go makes ahead. so much sense to me, and I, for a long time we've uh, had questions about what's the difference between crossroads and second chance, et cetera, et cetera. So this, I just, I, I circled a few things that I, are, I really support. Number one is providing transportation because I think that's a huge barrier to a lot of our students that, that need to, a little help getting to school, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I also love that you're gonna have on-site therapy and that it's voluntary. I think that that is a huge um, uh, change as well. And I have two questions. First is, um, just for the record, what does TRUE stand for again? Teach, Restore, Understand, and Educate. That is an awesome name. Um, and I noticed we only have one uh, 0.5 FTE social worker, and who, uh, so do we need more? I'm guessing. She's 0.5 right okay. now, and we have her already at Second Chance. Um, we share her with WIT. Okay. Um, and then we're hiring the 1.0 counselor. So that'll be huge that we have that 1.0 so, full-time person there. So that was my question, the on-site therapy. Are we still partnering with Catalpa or? Yeah, so we've kind of expanded our scope a little bit in terms okay. of our, our clinical therapy just because um, clinical therapists are hard to find. Mm -hmm. So if, if we really want to make sure we have that service available to all of our students, we've had to bring yeah. another partner. So, we have uh, brought in Rawhide to help support us in that as well as collaborative wellness. Okay. But yeah, it can help us still at the table too. That makes a lot of sense. I like having one source for our um, second chance and crossroad programs. Now it's the True Academy, and I think that that is fantastic. I'm really excited about this, and I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing fewer expulsions mm -hmm. come to the board, right? So that would be a good thing. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, First, I'll say I, I like the, the constant message about homeschools being involved, the check-ins, and, and working towards getting back to to that. Um, Ms. Carlin had brought up, um, you know, different options, and, and you had mentioned Rawhide. So I guess, from what I know, Rawhide is a faith-based organization. So how does that work with with therapy and that kind of thing and counseling for, you know, to not cross those lines. Yeah, I, so Rawhide works with quite a few public schools. They've really been working on expanding their, their clinical therapy supports okay. over the past several years. So as far as I know, there's no faith-based component to that clinical therapy piece. Okay, there's a hard line between them. Right, okay. so the, the clinical therapists they're bringing in are actual certified clinical therapists. So there's no affiliation with any sort of religious background or anything like that for those individuals. Okay. Any other questions? Well done. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. All right. Next up is our consent agenda. Uh, for the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background material on each item or has discussed it at, at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. If a board member wants to discuss any item, it would be pulled from the consent agenda and be voted on separately. Um, so the board will consider the approval of resolution number one. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta get there. <laughs> um, Resolution 1, 1A, uh, it reads, be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education approve the regular appointments, temporary appointments, resignations, and salaries as filed with the Secretary of Board of Education. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by Carlin, seconded by Wyman. 
Um, there is no discussion on this item, so please call the roll. Karen? Aye. Herzog? Aye. Carnes? Aye. Teschel? Aye. Wright? Aye. Wyman? Aye. Resolution carries. All right. So next up, we have an individually considered resolution. Um, hold on. I'm not. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't see it in my pocket. Um, uh, resolution number two, uh, it reads, uh, be it resolved that the Oshkosh Area School District Board of Education waive policy 0155.1, standing board committees and appointments with regard to making committee appointments no later than the first board meeting after the election of the board officers. And be it further resolved that the board approve the board President's selection of Dr. Bur Barb Herzog as a temporary committee member for the Education Committee for the period of August 11th through September 30th of 2022 as filed with the Secretary of Board of Education. Looking for a motion. So moved. Second. Moved by Wright and seconded by Carlin, or moved by Car Carnes, Carnes. Yeah. Yeah. seconded by Carlin. So uh, we are up for, open for discussion. So I, I guess I'll kind of guide that process as to why I'm asking for this. Um, it's been expressed to me by a couple of board members uh, that um, some life changes have taken place for them um, and that uh, they are essentially the month of August and part of September may be challenging in regards to engage in committees and even potentially board meetings. Um, and so there was no process to doing a temporary appointment um, and so the only way to do that is to is to create uh, is to waive the rules, which we have the authority to do. So, um, and so the essence of this request is to keep us on track with important elements that are coming through the education committee, um, and and also then supporting uh, the the life changes that are taking place with some of our board members as well. So, um, so with that, I would ask I would entertain any questions or any comments. So we had a meeting that we couldn't have because we didn't have a quorum. Okay. So it's to allow okay. us to at least move yeah. forward with the next meeting. So, okay. all right. Any other comments? Questions? No. Nope. Seeing none, please call the roll. Present. Present. Carnes. Aye. Heschel. Aye. Right. Aye. Wyman. Aye. Carlin. Aye. Resolution carries. Thank you. Um, we are at request for future agenda items. Is there any request for future agenda? Seeing none. Okay. Um, any announcements? Yes. Legislative committee meets tomorrow at 8 a.m. So I look forward to seeing some of you at that meeting tomorrow morning. Wonderful. Dr. Herzog. I have two quick announcements. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Linda Piron, Mary Beth Connors, Patty Kimball, Chris Steinhilber from our uh, special education arena who we did an outstanding presentation today at Southwest Rotary on the Brewing Futures program. They got a lot of accolades, made some connections, nice. uh, and I'm sure that they'll get some community engagement possibilities from that. Uh, secondly, I want to acknowledge our Oshkosh Rec Department, whom we have talked about earlier tonight, uh, teaming up with the Jolly Jester program, they are uh, producing the Music Man, the musical, at the Alberta Kimball Auditorium Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week, 7 o'clock, and there's a, a 2 p.m. matinee on Saturday. So um, I understand that there are children in the play or in the musical, but it's largely an adult cast, and uh, this would be an opportunity to see one of our outstanding mm -hmm. music teachers, uh, Bridget Duffy Ulrich in the role of Mary and the Librarian. So uh, I encourage everybody to attend that uh, musical coming up this week. That's Wonderful. Any other announcements? I have one, um, and it's just to remind um, everyone on the board that at our next board meeting, we'd like everyone to be here at 5 so that we can exchange our devices and get an orientation with our new device. So. That's it. If there's no other announcements, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. So moved. Second. Moved by Carnes, seconded by Carlin. Please call the roll. Carnes. Aye. Special. 
Aye. 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 Thank you for your time and energy tonight.